Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here. If you will, stand as we get started this morning. We're singing the Heart of Worship. It's about the other people that are seated in the pews. It's about you. 
And we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. May you be pleased with all that is said. May you prepare our hearts for what you have in store. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated now as we welcome our worship leader, Dr. Dick Reeves. Well, I assume announcements are part of the heart of worship. I was singing that song and I didn't have a bulletin. And in the middle of it, I go get it, then I come back and then sing that song. What was I thinking about? Was it about Jesus or about this? Well, anyhow, beyond that point, visitor response form, prayer thing. You guys pretty much know what that's all about. So put it in the offering if you have something to do there. And with all the emphasis I have, and all that I can say, ladies, fall kickoff is this week. Okay. Now, now that you know that, Avia Vandermeer is the speaker. It's all on your bulletin, but you have to RSVP. Probably. I guess they'd let you in if you didn't. But it is Thursday, so it's coming up. So please RSVP at the office before Thursday must have something to do with the number of places of food there will be. It doesn't say it there, but that must be the reason. So, just, she's going to talk about her experience wherever she had been. Haiti. Should be really interesting. Okay. Now, on a closer note to me, Jesus among secular gods, the study is going to begin again tonight at 5 o'clock and we're going to finish up over the next three weeks that study. If you have never been here for that, it doesn't matter. They're all self-contained studies. So you can come and you won't have really missed out except for the first three, but you can catch on right in the middle and it doesn't matter. So 5 o'clock tonight, it'll last one hour and then that's Okay, are there any other announcements? Okay, I do have a worship thought for today. Last week, I read a verse during our prayer time, and it was 2 Peter, 2, or 2 Peter 1, 3, and it just struck me, and I've been thinking about it all week, and, it, and it, what struck me is it, well, it says, seeing that His divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of Him who called us, called us, called us by His own glory and excellence. And if you go back to verse two, it's talking about God and Jesus. It was the word "true knowledge." True knowledge really stuck with me. In our world, what is truth? You know. Okay. So, so Danny. Today in Sunday school, he starts the study on knowing God. How about that? Okay. Well, we're. My thought is that to know the true God, it takes some part. It takes something. We have to do something. God reveals Himself to us because He is. We can know Him. We can know Him. So you know Him by reading the Bible. You know Him by listening to Pastor Matthew preach. You know them by your Sunday school teacher. And you know them through prayer. So those are those things that we as Christians, to really know true knowledge, we could be off base on what we think about God. Us as humans can do that really easy. So to really know the true God, you need to do that. So, And we give thanks that we have a godly pastor who preaches the Word. We give thanks that over the last Four decades we've had godly pastors that preach the word in this church. We've been really fortunate. Okay, now that I'm done talking, you guys can stand up and read. <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 Y
Okay, if the ushers would come forward, please. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is with joy that we come before you, that we can know that we can worship you through our offerings. And we pray, Lord, that you take what we give today and magnify that amount and use it to further your kingdom here on earth. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sorry. 
if you'd all stand, we'll sing our hymn of worship. Uh, they'll know we are Christians. You'll find it on page 429 in the hymnal if you follow along there, or the words will be on the screen. We'll sing all four verses. issues that they're dealing with in relationships. Lord, we lift them to you and pray that you would work in that situation. We lift to you also the many, many that are away traveling this weekend. Uh, we think of the Gillard family and the Yarrow family and the Whites and the Bartleys. All are out of the community this weekend and we ask, Lord, we lift them to you that you give them safety as they travel. Help them to know that in their absence, Lord, we are thinking of them and we pray that you would bless and encourage them and we ask that you'd bring them back safely. We lift you, little Bowen Oppenheimer, Lord, as he's been uh, dealing with a difficulty. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you bring healing to his body, that you be with uh, Jake and Jamie and the whole family, Lord. Father, we lift you, Terry and Nancy Mitchell, our friends. Uh, and we ask, Lord, that you continue to bless and encourage in the different situations that they are facing, Lord. We're thankful that Arlene is with us this morning and pray that you continue to be with her as she recovers from her surgery. We pray for Leonard and Vivian Hers and the different situations that they face as well, Lord. We ask that your hand would be upon them. And Lord, we pray with Terry and her family uh, and their situation with her brother, Lord. We just lift them all to you and pray that you would work in that. Lord, we know that there are other requests that haven't been mentioned, those that we've kept to ourselves, hidden in our hearts. And God, we're thankful that you even uh, work in unspoken requests that you know the desires of our hearts, you know the needs of our hearts before we ever do. And we thank you, God, that you work in those situations, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated now as the choir sings forever with everlasting God.
As the choir comes down to join you, the children may be dismissed for Children's Church, and we thank uh, Maddie uh, for leading Children's Church for us this morning, and Libby's helping her. I know some people were confused in the bulletin or in the newsletter when it said M. Coleman was doing Children's Church. I'm good, but I'm not that good. But you know, I rejoice this morning because, um, you know, as, as a pastor, it's always neat when church members get involved. As a father, it's always neat when your family gets involved. And uh, this morning, I, I'm going to try my very best to keep the sermon short. I know I say it every week, but it, and it never happens. But I realize that my two daughters are doing children's church. And they don't want it to last any longer than you do. And my wife is in the nursery with Kimberly Mayo. So if I have a long sermon, guess who's going to hear about it all afternoon? Oh, well. I know we don't really care the length of the sermon as long as we keep it, keep it going and it makes sense, right? Yeah. All right. Well, our, our scripture passage this morning is the passage we've been looking at uh, for the last several weeks. It's the Lord's Prayer or the Model Prayer. And it's the, the passage from Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read that as the choir comes and gets settled there. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Our, or in this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for this model prayer that has given us uh, so much insight, so much encouragement. Uh, is a great challenge to us to remember who you are, God, as we relate to you. We pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning as we have the time of the message, that it would be an opportunity for us to worship you as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, of course, over the last several weeks, we have taken this passage, this Lord's Prayer, the model prayer apart, and looked at different parts of it. And we've seen several things. Uh, we've looked at the idea that God is our God. No big shocker there. We were reminded last week uh, that, that God is our Father. Uh, also, we've seen that God is our King. God is our Lord. And last week, the subject of the sermon was God is our Provider, And we talked about uh, that in that passage, that word daily, you may remember there's some debate. Theologians love to debate things. And there was some debate about what that word means because you may, may remember, uh, if you were paying attention to the sermon last week, that the word daily appears in the Greek only in Matthew and Luke. So twice in all of the, all of the ancient Greek texts that they have. Now there's a fancy dancy Latin word for something like that. And um, I'm not going to try to say it because I won't make any sense out of it. But uh, in it though, we were talking about how God does provide our immediate needs physically, our continual needs, and he also provides our spiritual needs. And so as we talked about that word, you know, there's parts of that word that kind of emphasize both. And I think it's because God wants to remind us that, yes, he does provide for our needs today. And he provides for our needs for eternity. Amen. You know. Today we're going to continue and we're going to look at this verse, this part, this part of the Lord's Prayer that we probably all said hundreds and hundreds, thousands of times. This expression, forgive us, or forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we're going to really look at two parts of it, two ideas. The first one is the idea of forgiving. And as we get started, you know, I was thinking this week about how it's almost been a month already since the kids have been back to school. Can you believe that? Oh, it's, it's been amazing. It's almost been a month since we haven't had rain. No, it's not been that long ago. Since we, yeah, but anyways. But I thought about the many, many skills that the kids are taught 
in school. You know, math are taught addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, and of course they're, they're taught some of those in new ways and, and different things. I know the other day Libby sat down with me and we were doing some kind of math, and um, I said, well, this is, this is the answer. And she said, well, that's not how we were taught to do it. And I did it like that, and I got in trouble at school. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, you show me how you're supposed to do it, you know. But so they learn. And they learn history and geography. Uh, they learn spelling. At least I think they learn spelling. They learn English and physical education and family and consumer science. And I'm reminded that of the many ways that they encourage students also to be better citizens. And that's one thing I like about the schools in Clay Center. They really try. They have those times when they challenge them and they teach them about bullying and about avoiding bullying and not being bullies. Does it always work? No, right? But they also have, they've been learning, I think Libby, every year she's been in Clay Center Schools has learned about the seven habits of highly effective students. Have you learned about that, Kaylee? Libby was supposed to be sitting here when I was talking about this. Since she's not there, you're up there and you made eye contact with me, so you're the victim now. <laughs> Do you remember what the first habit is? You've been in the school now for, what, eight years. What's the first one? Be proactive. She got us. She gets a gold star. So they talk about teaching them be proactive and begin with the end in mind and put first things first and think win-win and seek first to understand and synergize and sharpen the saw. And if you don't know what all that means, that's okay. They're learning it and to help them to be better citizens, to have better uh, relationships in the community and with each other. And I was thinking about how uh, in school they evaluate those kind of things. They evaluate the results of the training that they have received. Now, in math classes and in English classes and history classes, it's pretty easy. They give them tests or quizzes, you know, and see how well they have retained the information. But something like this, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more difficult. The only proof that they're learning these seven habits is to see it in their lives, day to day. Well, you knew there was a point in me sharing all that with you. As Christians, that is often the case as well. Because there are important things to learn and to apply in our lives. But it's not always easy to tell. If we want proof of this, we need only to turn and look at this passage in the Bible, Luke or Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Again, how many times have we read and heard these words read to us? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We've heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it, and yet we still struggle with it. We still struggle with it. Well, this morning, as we decide to apply this truth, we're going to look a little bit deeper into this passage, and hopefully by exposing ourselves to the truth, we can get a hold of it, and we can allow it to get a hold of us. So are you ready? Well, at least Patricia's ready. All right. So first, forgiveness. It's a word that we use all the time. You know? It's a word that we value. We value forgiveness. We try to teach it in our culture. It's a word that is used many, many, many times in the New Testament. You know? And despite the many teachings, uh, we continue, as I said, to struggle with it. And it's likely because forgiveness is often connected at least we think it is, with our emotions. Now, even the thought, even if you bring up forgiveness, if you think about forgiveness or, or think about forgiving somebody, it doesn't just bring up the actual act of forgiving. It brings up what you have to forgive or what you're asking to be forgiven of. And that stirs our emotions all over again. In English, to forgive, we think of the definition to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, a flaw, or a mistake. And even in that definition, there's that word, feeling. All right? So that definition has a strong connection to emotion, but there's a simpler definition, which means to cancel a debt. 
to cancel a debt. Now, we're going to get into debt a little bit later, so don't worry about that. But as we get started, I want us to hold on to this simpler definition, because in it, we find a more accurate expectation and a more easily uh, applicable definition for forgiveness. All right? Now, in thinking about emotions, it's important that we realize for, for a second that the Greek word for forgive, which is afiemi, fancy dancy word, afiemi, amy, right? The Greek word for forgive has nothing to do with emotions at all. It is not connected with emotions at all. The English definition talks about feelings. 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 The Greek doesn't talk about feelings at all. There's really not a hint of it. So as we think about it, we need to move past to get a better understanding of forgiveness. We need to start that we start with the idea that we need to move past our feelings. And we need to realize that we as human beings, we are sometimes done a tremendous disservice by our emotions, by our feelings. We personally, and the way that we interact with others, the way that we relate to others. Have you ever had a disagreement with somebody, a husband or a wife or a child perhaps, where your emotions got involved? Hmm. And everything gets started off really small and everything gets blown way out of proportion. Maybe that just happens in the Bartley homes. <laughs> you know, we put so much stock in our emotions. We put so much emphasis on our emotions, how we feel, and yet so often, how we feel has very little to do with the actual situation at hand. You know, a person sometimes has a stressful day. Maybe things don't go well at work, and they come home to a small situation that otherwise would be nothing, would be overlooked. But they explode because of their emotions. A person maybe isn't feeling well, and a child or a pet or a spouse or a neighbor does something that they do probably every day. But we don't have the patience for it at that particular moment, and we react emotionally. Well, as Christians, the Lord teaches us the value of self-control. Amen. We're taught to bring every thought into captivity, aren't we? We're not meant to be controlled by our emotions. Right. Now, am I saying that we're not meant to be emotional? No, I'm not saying that at all. We are emotional creatures. Some of us are more emotional than others. You know, Christ demonstrated emotions many times. But he never allowed them to control him. And so we must not allow our emotions to control us or to cloud our judgment. This Greek word, athiemi, has a wonderfully simple and clear meaning. It means... Well, it, like so many Greek words, is a compound word. It's got those two parts, and you mash those two parts together. The first part means away from. The second part means send. So when you put away from and send together, you get what? To send away from. It's not hard to understand, is it? And I like it like that. You know, I don't like it when it's difficult, and I have to scratch my head, and I have to read it 75 times, and... Go, I still don't get it. I like it when it's simple. And you know what? So much of God's truth is very simple. Amen. Simple to understand up here. Yes. Not always so simple to apply in real life. Now, we see that this verse is often looked at again as a petition, a request from us to God. Forgive us, it says. We're asking God to send away our Debt. And again, we're going to talk about debt a little bit more in a little bit. The good news is God, through Christ's death, through his burial and resurrection, the work of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, has done that. Yes. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Yes. Hebrews 8, 12 says, Their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now that is an interesting, uh, an interesting verse there. 
And in case you're wondering, that word for remember, it doesn't mean that God forgets. All right? What it really says is that he is not going to recall them. That he's not going to mention them. That he's not going to bring them up. That he is not, he is going to purposefully not remind himself. You know? It's like when you get in a disagreement with somebody, you choose to forget all the things that happened in the past instead of bringing them all up. Amen. It's that choice. He will not remember our sins. And I think uh, the best picture of this is, is, I, is in Isaiah 43, verse, 27, what, verse 25. Rather. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, remembering our overall context, we want to keep this portion of this model prayer in the context that we've been looking at, and we've been focusing this prayer, we've been saying that it is a prayer, it's a declaration, it's a statement of God and who God is, and we've talked about God, you're my Father, God, you're my God, God, you're my King, God, you're my Lord, God, you're my Provider. Well, and here we see truly that God is our Reconciler. God reconciled by removing the debt. You know, debt, reconciliation, those are financial terms, aren't they? You know, when we get a bank statement, we're supposed to compare the bank statement that we get and compare our checkbook, and we, we compare and contrast, and we call that what? Reconciling, right? And reconciling means a couple different things in finance. But there's also the personal aspect of reconciliation. But God is our reconciler. And it's important that we can see in the structure of this verse, too, where the emphasis is. Because we read this verse and we go, Father God, forgive, or forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And a lot of times we, we look at the last part. But the first part is the emphasis of this phrase. The first part, it reminds us that you, God, forgave us. That's the emphasis. And we need to note something else that's very interesting about this verse. Because both verbs for forgive in this verse, we don't see it so much in our English, but if you look, at the, if you look deeper, both of the verbs for forgive are actually past tense verbs. They're actually past tense. So instead of being a petition, instead of being a request, instead of asking for something, we're making a statement really saying, God, our reconciler, you forgave us. And we also forgave. We released. We sent away. We discharged. It's not saying, God, you forgave us, or God, forgive us, and we will forgive or we might forgive, or we could forgive, it is saying we forgave. And the idea is this, as believers in Jesus Christ, we've been forgiven of so much. So of course we're going to forgive each other. The idea is it should be a no-brainer. When we show an unwillingness to forgive, we show that we have forgotten what God has done for us. Ephesians 4.23 says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3.13, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also, here's the word, must. So as we see this passage, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, we're reminded that, God, you are our reconciler. You forgave us. And we forgive our brothers and sisters. Now, the second thing that we want to look at is this word debt or debtor. Now, debt or being a debtor is not really a new concept for us in the United States of America, is it? We as a nation are a nation of debt. 
I checked yesterday, and I'm sure it's gone up since yesterday, and our national debt was $21.5 trillion, but don't worry about that. Jim Brinkman said he's going to take care of that this afternoon. He's going to write a check. But you know, anyone that has a car payment or a mortgage or student loan payments or credit card payments, you know, has debt. Now, uh, debt, from our modern English-American understanding, means something that is owed or something that is due. And in this verse, the verse that we're looking at this morning, there is that element of debt. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, um, the word, the Greek word there, it's connected with the idea of having a debt. And later, the word debtor is also connected with that Greek word. And it's true for the parallel verse in Luke chapter 11, verse 4. In the second half of that verse, he uses the word indebted. And each of those is connected with the idea of owing. Owing something. Now, what debt is being spoken of? All right? Well, we get a clue when we look at that passage in Luke chapter 11 because Luke's gospel uses a different word for debt. All right? Luke says, he doesn't say, forgive us our debts as we forgive those that are indebted to us. He says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So when we take those passages together, we get a clearer picture. Now, some people may say, oh, well, isn't that an inconsistency? Isn't that a contradiction? It doesn't say the same thing? Well, these passages, Matthew 6 and Luke 4, they don't contradict, rather they clarify. All right? And the truth is that sin, the sin that was looked upon, by God that we look upon, it is really a moral debt. It is a debt. Now, if we go, well, why the difference? Why does Matthew say debt and Luke say sin? Well, it's, it's really got to do with their audience. For a Jewish mindset, sin was looked on as a debt. And Matthew's audience was Jewish Christians. So it would make sense. Luke's audience were Gentiles. It was a Gentile audience, and they didn't have the same background, the same understanding necessarily that Matthew's gospel did. But when we compare the two passages together, it, it just is very clear. There is agreement there. So we're seeing that the idea of debt here in this context, in this context is clearly connected with sin. The idea is someone has done something wrong. Shocking, right? <coughs> We've never heard that before. Now, sadly, we are really, really, really good, and I think I've confessed this before, but we are really good at cataloging the debts of others. She said this, and he didn't do that, and my parents never did this, and my kids won't do that, and my pastor forgot this, <coughs> and my church friend said that. You know, we're really good at understanding debt, especially in the context of someone sinning against us, aren't we? We're really, really good. And so for us to say, forgive our debtors, we get it. We understand what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to let go of the sin that others have committed against us. But we need to realize that there is a deeper meaning still within this word for debt. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you ready for the deeper meaning? Meaning? Are you ready, Patricia? Yes. You ready, John? Nancy, are you ready? You might not be ready, because when I tell you what the deeper meaning is, you might say, oh, I wish he'd kept his mouth shut. At least there was no amens, so that's good. <laughs> because this deeper meaning, it changes the whole way we look at this prayer, this model prayer, at least this portion of it, this example of prayer. Because the truth is, when we pray, when we're praying debt, we're praying more than just letting go of a list of wrongs 
or a list of debts or faults and failures because we are not actually meant to focus on the debt. Rather, we are praying about the result or the after effect of the debt. And that is the deeper meaning. That is the part that is sometimes buried as we rush through this prayer, as we go through it. When we pray about the dead and the debtors, it's not about the people or the sins so much as it is. It's the impact of those sins. So if we put this verse together, forgive, let go, release, debt, sin and its impact. We are praying, God, you let go of my sins and the impacts that they have on our relationship and fellowship. But as we continue in that verse, on, and I, we are saying, and I let go of the sins committed against me by others and their impact that they have had on my relationships and fellowship. And we must remember that this is past tense. This is saying, we did it, we made the choice. You say, well, it hasn't even happened yet. No, it hasn't even happened yet. Tomorrow, somebody's going to offend you. Tomorrow, somebody's going to hurt you. Tomorrow, you're going to be mad at somebody. But you know what? When we accepted Christ as our Lord, we recognized all that we've been forgiven of, and we make the choice that we're going to forgive others. Amen. So it's already been decided that we're going to Forgive. And this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it really gets real. One of the words that Lucas loves to say, and we've banned it in our house now because he's said it so much. And of course, anytime you ban a word, you start saying it yourself. But he loves to say, literally. I am literally, he says, I am literally doing this and literally doing that. And, and I keep saying, well, do you know what it means to figuratively do something? You know, he doesn't, but he'll say, I'm literally doing this. He'll be like, I'm literally sitting here, and I'm like, I figured that out, but thank you. <laughs> but this is literally where it gets real. Because, you know, many of us say we forgive, but we really don't. We put a smile on our face. Yeah, we put a big smile, especially around those people that have hurt us. You know, and sometimes you can tell how well the relationship is because the closer I get to Elgina, the smile gets bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and I want to know. I'm just kidding. I think things are good. They're good on my end. Okay. She wouldn't say it publicly anyway, so I'm just kidding. But her, her, father, her husband, rather, is the head deacon, so I would know if there was a problem with it. But sometimes we, we put on a facade, we, we, have a, a, we, we fake it, and we've not really let go of the debt. It's still on our books. We've not let go of the impact of it. We still have the walls up to, around us to protect us. In the Lord's Prayer, we're saying, God, you are my reconciler. You let go of my sin and reconciled my relationship with you. And God, I too forgive. I let go of those that have sinned against me and choose to be reconciled to them. Now the challenge is, this requires us to really live our faith. This requires us to really make that choice. Is it easy to do always? No. Sometimes it's very difficult Sometimes we have to make the choice over and over and over and over again. Because we're human beings and we are often controlled by our emotions and sometimes people hurt us bad. Sometimes they do. And perhaps you're sitting here this morning and you're going, Pastor, I wish you wouldn't talk about this stuff because you don't know how bad I've been hurt. Well, we've all been there. I don't want to... Now, you know, I don't want to invalidate what you're feeling or what you're thinking, but we've all been hurt. 
many times. And the idea isn't meant that we're going to have a pity party. We're all going to stand up and say, well, who's been hurt the worst? We don't want that. God doesn't want that. Rather, we celebrate in God's grace and God's mercy and God's compassion and God's love that he has poured it out upon us, and we now have the opportunity to extend that to somebody else. Did I deserve God's forgiveness? No. And perhaps the people in our life that hurt us, we think, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. They probably don't. But we have the wonderful opportunity to demonstrate the grace of God. And you know, you know, one of the things that I've often found in the experiences that I've had when somebody gets hurt me, very often they don't even realize that they've hurt me. And I've chosen to carry that baggage for just a couple minutes because I'm very spiritual and I let it go real fast. No, I could carry the baggage for decades. And then you go and finally talk to them and go, what? I wish you would have said something. I wish this, you know. We have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. And as we say this prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We want to be reminded what Christ has done for us and how we ought to look at each other through the eyes of love. And hopefully that will encourage us to, to show that forgiveness as God asks us to. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this opportunity to look at your word and to be challenged by it. I know that we as human beings, we do struggle because we are human. It's easy to um, allow people to hurt us and then to remain wounded. But Lord, this morning, let us rather choose to live a life of forgiveness. To not allow ourselves to be in bondage to that. Because that's not what you want for us. That's not what we want for each other. Father, we thank you that you have forgiven us by grace, through faith, that it wasn't a result of anything that we did because we cannot earn it, we cannot deserve it, we cannot pay for it, we cannot be good enough. It's only a result of what you did through your Son, through your Spirit. And Lord, today we accept that free gift and we thank you for it. And we want to share that gift with others. We want to demonstrate the love, the grace, the forgiveness that you have given to us in the lives of others. And so this morning, if there's somebody that has hurt us, let us make that choice. Let us purpose in our hearts to let that go. And when Satan may bring it back to our mind, we say, no, we've given that up. We've let it go. We've released it. And let us, if there's somebody that has harmed us or hurt us, let us to begin to pray for those people. That God would bless them and encourage them. That God would strengthen the relationship that you have, that we have with them, and that God has with them. For God's glory. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your power. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand as we have our hymn of invitation?
All right, so I lied to you. I didn't give you a fast sermon, but at least we got done on time. We do want to invite you to stay for the covered dish. Even if you didn't bring something, there's always enough food. You're welcome to stay and enjoy a time of fellowship with us. I want to remind you about the 5 p.m. this evening, uh, the study Jesus Among Secular Gods. It's a fantastic study. You're invited to come. And youth, we will meet at 6 p.m. as well, youth and the elementary. Uh, but let's be dismissed with prayer. Father God, we ask that you go with us now. As we go to our time of fellowship or those that are leaving, we pray that you would bless the remainder of this day. We pray that we would be known as people that love each other, people that are willing to forgive each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Secular gods. I know he does show something. No, they don't use. They don't use that. Uh -huh. Okay. I was thinking they showed a video. I came. They the do last show a video. They use it up here. Oh, okay. 
come from there. This doesn't have anything to do oh, with the nice. video. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's just <laughs> not unless I want to record it again. Go, but no, they, they don't. Again. They don't okay. use that thing. Okay. All right. I was telling Doug, uh, Roger's youngest brother was married to a gal from Green, uh, Dahlia Noyes, and they divorced years ago. But she still keeps up with the family, and so I called her when I had the floods down there in Manhattan. And she was asking me which one of the boys had passed away. And I told her it was Lonnie, and she said, well, Darlene's still, uh, Yeah, Dahlia. Oh, yeah, she's a good friend of Darlene. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. yeah they correspond. Yeah, they do, back and forth. So she was asking me about Darlene, and I told her what had been going on with her to, since she'd been up in the hospital that night. So, uh, so anyway, she sent her. Thank you. Well, we definitely feel all the prayers and comfort from the community. Yeah. It's, if you have to go through it, it's a good place to go through it. Yeah. And what we all do is 